Okay. So, um, I will ask all of our uh, guests to switch off uh, their microphones for the beginning and uh, after that. So. Andre, please switch off the microphone because I can hear <laughs> your. So, uh, greetings to everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure for us to welcome uh, all of you uh, on the third day of uh, Semana Hispana Rusa, organized by Peter de Grey, St. Petersburg Polytechnic University and uh, University of Cadiz, in cooperation with uh, Polytechnica de Madrid and uh, High School of Economics de Moscou. My name is Lana, and I'm coordinating cooperation with the Bear American Partners at SPBPU. So our seminar today is dedicated to scientific cooperation between Russia and Spain, and uh, in particular, um, we'll talk about educational and scientific cooperation between UPM and SPBPU. Uh, our universities are strategic partners. We implement uh, a lot of uh, joint educational research and cultural projects. UPM professors participating constantly at SPBPU visiting professors program. And um, together we also col collaborating with industry. Uh, and uh, since 2019, uh, information Center of SPBPU in Madrid is operating on the basis of uh, our strategic partner, UPM. On this seminar, a representative of Talgo company will tell us about uh, high-speed railway, railway projects uh, in Russia. And professors of UPM will tell us about um, the most important joint projects and results of cooperation between our universities in the field of engineering. So um, if you have any questions uh, during the uh, uh, seminar. You can write uh, your questions in chat on YouTube and we'll ask our speakers to answer your questions after their presentations. So first of all, I would like to give a floor to um, the Vice Rector for Academic Strategy and Internationalization of UPM, Professor Jose Miguel Atienza. Thank you, Lana. Good morning, everyone from Madrid. It is a privilege to be able to share together with three prestigious universities, such as the Polytechnic University of San Petersburg, Peter the Great, the University of Cadiz, and the Moscow Higher Education, Higher School of Economics, uh, this worship dedicated to an issue as important to us as the relations between Russia and Spain. And I really thank you, the organizers, for preparing these sessions, this session about research. Let me start with some words about our university, the Technical University of Madrid, Universidad Politécnica de Madrid, UPM. UPM uh, has 21 colleges and 18 research centers covering all main engineering and technology domains, as well as architecture, sports sciences, and fashion design. UPM has around 3,000 professors, 40,000 undergraduate students, and about 8,000 graduate students and doctoral students. Universidad Politécnica de Madrid is the oldest and the largest technical university in Spain. Currently, it is ranked as the first university in science and technology within the Spanish-speaking related area, which includes Spain and Latin American countries. And then we are number 76 in the world in the QS ranking in engineering. And we have some of our colleges in top 50, both in, Q in QS and Shanghai rankings. In summary, UPM is a university aimed at excellence in education and research in applied technological domains. 
UPM is also a leader in innovation and entrepreneurship. We are in between the top 100 European most innovative universities following the Reuters ranking, and we are number one in Spain as part with patent application, research and development funds, and research and development contract with industry. Also in new tech ventures, startups, spin-offs creation. Most ancient of UPM colleges were founded in the last 18th century and beginning of 19th century. And meaningfully, one of our founders, Agustin de Betancourt, developed and organized fully infrastructures, communication and transportation system in Russia under the Tsar Alexander I, being considered the founder of the modern engineering in Russian Empire. In Russian Empire. Since then, we have a close relation with Russian universities. Our internationalization strategy is based mainly on building long-term relationship based on trust and friendship with the best technical universities in the world. In this sense, we are the Spanish university with more and better relations with Russian universities in research, currently collaborating with more than 15 universities located all across Russia. Moscow, St. Petersburg, Kursk, Tomsk, Samara, Novgorod, Krasnodar, ETC. Its activity is increasing every year in collaboration of mobility programs, European Erasmus programs, and research and development projects. I would particularly like to highlight our close relation with the Polytechnic University of St. Petersburg, Peter the Great. We have a strategic agreement with them that is allowing us to move forward so much in students' exchanges, but also in joint research projects. Several of our best and most successful teachers teach in Polytech summer schools, and also our students attended the Polytech summer schools, gaining an experience and very profitable knowledge. Since this September, the information center of uh, the Polytechnic University of St. Petersburg at our industrial school is open, and it's the first open center in a, Spain, in a Spanish university where all the students, professors, can, with a personalized treatment, directly obtain information about the joint programs between UPM and Peter the Great activity, uh, university activities and projects. For Russian students, we offer our laboratories with the latest technological advances and uh, knowledge of our best recognized teachers worldwide, robotics, nanotechnology, smart buildings, biomedicine, nuclear energy, high-speed trains, power, ETC. And we have more joint projects for the next future, like a double degree at the master level or a co to tell at the doctoral level, open between the two universities, UPM and Peter the Great University. These long-term relations are always focusing on the development of joint projects, both in the education area, joint and level programs, and in the research area. In this sense, I would like to highlight the importance of collaboration in the field of technology. Technological innovation is now the key that builds the advancement, the advancement of societies. Research is quite important for us, and this is why we are always looking for champions, for professors that are particularly active and interested in developing these relations. And here today, we will have some examples of our champions, and I really thank them for their work and for their presentations today. That is all from my side. I wish you all enjoy the presentations today, and thank you very much from Madrid. Espasiva. So, thank you, Professor Atienza. And now our first speaker uh, with the presentation today is Professor Pablo Garrido Martinez. He is representative of Talgo Company and also professor of the Department of Mechanical Engineering at the UPM School of Industrial Engineers. So, Pablo, please. Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for the introduction. I'm going to share my screen, so let me know when are you able to see it. Okay, so can you see my screen now? Yes, yes, that's okay. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction, uh, Professor Artienza. Thank you very much all the colleagues that have invited me to this uh, uh, Congress, to this uh, conference, this call. Uh, very welcome to this presentation. My name is Pablo Garrido. I've been the project manager for the Talgo trains, Talgo high-speed trains in Russia, uh, the street trains, which we are going to speak today about them. 
And I would like to highlight in this presentation the importance of the relationship between universities and between the um, companies as Talgo. Because as uh, Professor Atienza has introduced before, it's very important the innovation, it's very important the technology, but it's really important to go ahead together, university investigations, and of course the companies that we have to make these investigations to the practice and to the practical ways to implement it and to improve society. So um, first of all, I will do a quick introduction of uh, what's happening in Talgo, what do we have in Talgo, and why it's important to consider this innovation and technology in Talgo. Talgo was founded in 90, 1942 with an innovation culture for the very beginning because it was not a standard train, a standard concept of all the mechanical um, engineering, all the mechanical concepts of how a train is uh, it's working. In this sense, uh, Talgo has always um, see the technological part as a very important base for the future. So for the very first moment, we have different concepts of other companies, for example, like the lightweight construction. Our wagons, our coaches are made of aluminium, which is uh, uh, considering the weight is much less weight. We have less maintenance costs, and of course, we can reach more acceleration in the curves. Also, we have articulated coaches. It has a better behavior with the infrastructure, better aerodynamic behavior, and better rail guidance, which is impacting less in all the rails, in all the wheels, and of course, in all maintenance operations associated. It's very important to consider the infrastructure. I mean, the interface between our trains and the infrastructure. Normally, the companies which are manufacturing trains are only considering the train, the ones that they are uh, building or constructing the infrastructure, only this the infrastructure. But then in the end, we have a, an interface that we have to respect and of course improve infrastructure and manufacturers. So the articulated coaches are always contributing to a better behavior with this infrastructure. Um, we have also a natural pendular system, an independent wheel, which is uh, gaining this speed in the curves and of course considering the maintenance uh, is just better for safety less operations in the maintenance and we have better dynamic behavior in this sense not the wheels not the suspension we have complete different concept of train as the others so in the end we are making things different we should make things different if, what, if we want different results and to go ahead and improve in the near future Okay, in this picture, we are able to see what is the difference between, between this pendular system and the normal system, because our pendular system is considering all the structural part as a one part that is going inside the curves once the train is entering in that curve. So in that sense, with more speed, we have the same safety levels as our competitors. Of course, safety first is our first, our first rule in the railway, but after the safety first, we have to improve all the concepts, so all the maintainability is respected, availability and reliability of the train, because uh, we will see in the end of the presentation that we are all focused to a future, considering the new technologies, considering the industry 4.0, where all the artificial intelligence and other technologies that are being investigated should be implemented to these trains and, of course, in the high-speed trains that we are manufacturing now, in the present and in the future. Okay, why innovation, research and transfer of technology? First of all, I would like to share with you this video and I hope you can listen to it.
We have seen in this video a summary of what happens in this Talgo project, Talgo Russian project. Of course, it has been a very difficult task, but very interesting for Talgo to have these shrines uh, in Russia and working in Russia. But why? Because uh, we had to consider extreme weather conditions. We have to consider particular characteristics of Russia. And we had to make before a lot of um, tests with our uh, test train, with uh, investigations with university to see what's, what, what do we need to implement in the trains as an innovative technology so we can have the same train that we have here in Spain or in Europe running in Russia due to these weather conditions or other particular issues that are raised in a country as Russia. So we had a very first moment when we had to consider our particular wheel set, particular dynamic behavior, and particular systems in the train, what do we have to do to make it work? And that's the, the, this, this presentation is going to focus on why it's important, this innovation, research, and transfer of technology. Of course, as we have uh, seen before, uh, Talgo has a particular wheel set, dynamic behavior, and system on the train. That has, uh, let's say, a good point because we are different to the rest, so we can have uh, certain advantages. But on the other hand, all the investigations and researchers, in the end, um, they are focusing the normal system. So Talgo, in that sense, is considering that we need to uh, associate with different uh, universities and researchers because we also need help to develop this future, this technology, this, um, let's, this innovative uh, research to our trains and our particular system so we can develop as the rest of the manufacturers and the rest of the countries are doing. So that's why we need a constant innovation. We should be more competitive. We should reduce uh, the interface impact with infrastructure. We should increase the speeds of the train and we should maintain a very important concept of the trains on any mechanical system, let's say, which is Reliability, availability, maintainability, and safety. That are the four concepts that we have to, with these new technologies, to progress and to uh, continue improving to be more competitive than the rest. Uh, in this sense, uh, somebody could ask, okay, and why Talgo in the end was selected to have these trains in Russia? Because in the end, there are many manufacturers. Well, these particular systems that we have discussed this independent wheel, this pendular system, uh, makes that with the same infrastructure, we can have less impact in the infrastructure and gain more speed in the curves and in the entire, let's say, in the entire route, in the entire line. So without touching the infrastructure that all of us consider that is uh, quite expensive for a country to create a new infrastructure, for example, in Spain now, we are little by little, uh, constructing the new high-speed train lines, but it's a project of uh, a lot of uh, a big budget and with an impact of 10, 20 years to have this new infrastructure. But in case you have the infrastructure and you do not want to change it, it's a very good point to have a Talgo train with this particular system because without touching this infrastructure, you are able to reduce the time expected for this line or for this route. And that's why Talgo was selected for these uh, three strains that we have now in, in Russia. Of course, this constant innovation cannot be done by our own in the company. Talgo is a company that manufactures trains. We are not researchers. All of us, we are not researchers. So that's why it's very important to consider all the university relationships as the University of St. Petersburg or as University Polytechnic University of Madrid that we have recently signed together, Polytechnic University of Madrid and Talgo, um, call a cooperation formula so we can get in touch very constantly. We are making some projects with our uh, students and for people of uh, from Talgo because we consider that we have a lot of knowledge to give to the university and to the students because in the end our 
these students are our future workers, are the future of the society. So it's very good to take the company and to be next to the university. And on the other hand, for universities, it's very important to give this knowledge, this research, this transfer of technology to the company. So I think it's a win-to-win -win relationship that is very important to respect. And from Talgo side and from Polytechnical University of Madrid, we are, of course, completely aligned and working together as uh, this uh, new cooperation formula is uh, arising up. Uh, after this research to maintain this content innovation, we have this transfer of technology. Between countries, we have to help each other. We have to transfer this technology from one to the others. And with this formula is the way that we have give this uh, transfer to our Russian colleagues because in the end to put our particular system in the Russian conditions it has been a cooperation between both countries to have these trains running at 220 kilometers per hour. Um, it's very important to consider that also the changing gauge system you know that uh, Russian gauge of the rail and European gauge is different and Tao has a particular system that can make this uh, gauge change in the train without dismounting all the wheel set part of the train. And in the end of the presentation, we'll see a video of how the first time was this street train changing the gauge system in the um, Paris between Russia and Europe. Okay, now let's talk about this particular experience of Talgo in Russia. Um, we started by September two, 2015 uh, with the services of Moscow Nizhny Novgorod. Right? We have four trains doing this Moscow Nizhny Novgorod uh, service. Um, this trip was reduced in time due to this better behavior of Talgo in the infrastructure. So it was very good for railway operation, for RGD, for FPK, was very good for these operations because there were shorter trips between Moscow and Nizhny Novgorod. We have a maximum high speed of 220 kilometers per hour. There are trains more or less of 17, 18, up to 20 coaches. And we have uh, seven daily services in normal conditions. Uh, the total time for this Moscow Nizhny Novgorod is uh, three hours and 35 minutes. Um, and the other line, the other big line that we have from the very beginning is also Moscow and Berlin trains. I think this is the most important line because it's connecting this European and this uh, Russian part. Uh, and the train is going through four countries. Uh, for the railway sector, it's a very, very important issue to have certified and aligned four countries to have the same train going from one point to another. And also with uh, gate changing, as you see in the presentation, we have uh, 1,520 millimeters in Russian railways and 1,535 millimeters in European railways. So this gate system, this changing gate system has made possible to have a Moscow Berlin direct train without changing the train or without impacting a lot in the time of this service. Uh, actually, the service is considered in more or less 20 hours, 40, 40 minutes. Um, it's going from Moscow to Smolensk, Minsk, Brest, Varsovia, Poznan, and then to Berlin. And it's a night train. Um, recently, uh, we are very proud to announce that uh, till summer, we have another line, the third line, which is going from Moscow from some, for, to St. Petersburg. So it's very good and very, there are very good news for Talgo, for Russian colleagues, for Spanish colleagues to consider that today we have also this Talgo train, this street train going through Moscow to St. Petersburg, running at 220 kilometers per hour. Okay, so one of the most important points that we have to consider is the snow, the ice. For Talon, it was the first time to build a train 
with better with extreme weather conditions let's say we have to make a lot of, of research you can see in the picture that is in the presentation how the ice was uh, going in through the wheels the brake system so we have to consider different other mechanical and electrical systems to get rid of the ice and to assure the maximum level of safety and functionality of the train in this sense we have to put some hot air uh, blowers to avoid the freezing elements in the wheel set. Air blow system also in the automatic steps because once the step to go out of the train or to enter in the train was um, moving, in the end with the ice what stops. So we have to consider this blowing system that we have now in our movable steps of the train. And of course we have lessons learned. That has been a very important uh, experience from Tago to know how to build a train under extreme weather conditions with very low temperatures and also considering the snow. We didn't know anything about the snow till we uh, investigated and we did research with uh, different uh, people regarding this snow and all the consideration that we had to put in the design phase of the train to make this possible, to make this high-speed train of Russian uh, railways possible. So we can see in this video how the train is running and this is the result, result of all these investigations, research and all this new technology and innovation that we have to work together, Russian colleagues, different researchers, universities and then Talbo to obtain this result of this high-speed train running with this condition. This is the Krasnodar rail to, you know, that to do different tests. In this case, the, um, the brake system test, we have to go to a specific ring, test ring. So we went to Krasnodar in December 2018 to make the last test to, uh, to this, uh, this train. So we had to go to Krasnodar with the train and then in the test ring, make all the tests at the maximum speed to consider an alternative brake system of the train. And the other important concept from Talgo for this transfer of technology is uh, to consider the wheel set automatic with change. Uh, in the end, as we have uh, independent wheels, we are able to um, move one of the wheels and change the position if we have a mechanical system that can um, can reach this uh, movable position. In this sense, in the picture, you can see that we have five movements. The first movement, uh, the train is entering down. I'm going to try to show you with um, the pencil. So the train, for example, is entering here. You see that um, this width and this width of the rail is completely different. We should say that this is the Russian um, with and this is the European one. So if we are entering in this um, in this position, number one, the first thing is that this uh, the coach is supported by this blue part, this blue rail, which is supporting all the weight of the coach that is entering in the width change installation. Then the red one, the red rails, this one, these two. What they are doing is to enter in the position of the safety mechanical uh, pieces and get them down. So it can allow the wheels to move. So the red position, the red rail is um, unsafeting this mechanical piece that can make the wheel move. Then we have the green ones. As you see, the green ones are not completely straight. So the green ones are pushing out or pushing in this sense uh, in 
um, this wheel so you can make the change of the wheel. And then in the end, again, the red ones are saved in the position of the wheels and you can go out of the uh, installation with the width, the, with yeah, the gauge completely changed. That's a very good idea. In the end, there are four rails, as you can see, uh, in a good position. And with this mechanical, simple system, we are able to change the gauge from the, Euro the Russian one to the European one. Let's see a video to demonstrate how it's working. Um, we have in Belarusia this installation. Okay. Um, Okay, so till this point, another question is what's next? What's happening in the future? What do we have to do in, with the trains in the future? Of course, we should increase the speed, but to increase the speed, we should make sure that the infrastructure is ready. Of course, all the traction, wheel set, and other systems for the train are completely ready for it. But in the end, a big concept uh, to implement uh, is related with the new technologies. All of us, we are listening in the state of the art about the industry 4.0, maintenance 4.0, and this consideration of the new technologies to be implemented should be the future for all manufacturers and for all operators or companies that are responsible for the infrastructure of the high-speed trains. So how can we do it? Well, in the end, uh, with this artificial intelligence concept, we should be able to recognize patterns. We should be able to identify which are the critical components of the train, the critical failure modes that can make the train stop. And um, with this information and all the historic data, because we are we have a lot of data to study from the past, with all this data using the intelli artific artificial intelligence and new technologies, we should be able to create a concept of condition-based maintenance. It's uh, what considered is all the pattern recognitions, the, let's say the healthy, how, how is the health of the train every day? So we can recognize if we have a pattern that could end in a failure mode and we should take this train to the depot to make the inspections or maintenance review, or even if the train is good enough to continue continue running. It's important to consider that nowadays we have the corrective maintenance in which we are replacing the components that has failed, okay? And then we have the preventive one. We have to do uh, regular inspections, maintenance inspections to make sure that we are um, considering the good maintainability of the components, but based on the experience of the supplier. But normally the preventive inspections are done in advance are just to cover a possible defect or failure that you could have in the near future. And then we are evolving to this predictive maintenance. We are not calling the manufacturers or the experts, we are not calling the train to depot. It's the train who should raise its hand and say, okay, I should go to depot because I have recognized with these patterns, with this condition-based maintenance that I co could have a possible failure in the next days, in the next hours, and in this sense to program this maintenance based on how is the train, how is the health of this train, and it's being monitorized every second with the most important parameters and variables to take on account. Um, using the machine learning, we could be able to identify these patterns and, of course, to have this real-time monitoring and to make decisions. It's important to make quick decisions, even if the train should go to depot or not, 
because to stop the fleet is uh, a lot of cost for the operators and uh, very good train the very good concept the ideal concept is the train that should not be maintained so we have everybody to focus in to go at this ideal concept of not having to maintain the train because the train is always in perfect conditions um, this machine learning that we are working nowadays in this cooperation with the university and Talgo. From university, we have created a specific group with Talgo to identify these patterns, to analyze all the data that we have. So we are able to identify with neural networks, which is the good behavior of the critical system of the train. Um, we should focus in these systems to um, develop uh, condition-based maintenance that could allow Talgo and could allow the state of the art to control the entire fleet with a minimum cost, minimum resources, and of course with the highest level of reliability, availability, and maintainability of these our trains, the fleet of the trains. And that's what we are considering regarding the future in the trains. But we should also take on account that the train is part of the railway concept. We have the operators, we have the infrastructure. For example, the operators are working every day to optimize the human resources, the number of trains, the assistance of the trains, and all these neural networks or artificial intelligence should uh, focus this operator to optimize to the minimum this impact in the cost and this organization of all the resources, but also the infrastructure. It's not only that the train has its own system to identify um, any pattern, let's say any failure mode that we can have, but also it's important, as you can see in this uh, slide, the infrastructure to consider in the infrastructure these other systems that could help the manufacturers of the train to identify if something's wrong. For example, the roof inspection. If we have a camera to identify what's happening with the um, pantographs, if the pantograph uh, is worn and we have to change it, we can receive this information. Also in the, in the infrastructure, we can have lower parts inspections to see if something is not tight enough and we can have a safety problem or maybe the bearings inspections. You know that the bearing temperatures is one of the most critical um, issue to consider a safety critical component in a train. So we have uh, bearings inspection in the infrastructure. In case the temperature detector is quite high, we can have an alarm to the um, manufacturer to review the train or to see what's happening in the train. We can also have site integrity inspections or, for example, brace, brace disc and parts inspection. You know that the parts uh, for the brake disc uh, once it's warm, we have to replace it. So maybe we can have a little camera in the infrastructure that could monitorize how is the status of these parts. And once it's going to the end, to uh, alarm the manufacturer and say, okay, you should replace the part of this position of this train because it's getting to the end of the remaining uh, life for the component. And that's the future for the manufacturers, but also the future for all the railway sector, because we have to agree it and to focus in the specific um, objective, common objective, and commonly see which system we have to control and which systems we have to implement these new technologies to make our trains more, uh, more safe, to make it better in reliability, availability, and of course, in the end, with a good experience for the passengers. Because remember that neither operator, infrastructure, or Talgo are to uh, manufacture trains or, manuf or create a railway service. It's a complete service for the society. That's why we have to make our best to cooperate together to get to the very state of the art with the researches, universities and investigations to offer our best service to the style society with these high-speed trains.
So thank you very much uh, for the invitation. And thank you also for both universities because we are in a straight cooperation together from Talgo side. We are very proud and very happy to cooperate with all of you. And of course, we have the sense that we need your participation. We need you for uh, creating a truly great journey. As in the census says, a truly great journey begins and ends on the railway tracks. So thank you very much for your attention. And um, please let me know if there are any questions. I will be very happy to answer it. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you, Pablo, for your presentation. It was really interesting. And yes, we have several questions for you, actually. So uh, the first question is, will Talgo impose the railway, the railway industry in Russia? I think it, they mean in the nearest future. Well, in this sense, uh, from Talgo side, we will be very happy to continue uh, manufacturing train for Russia. It's true that we have had a first experience with these three trains, and we are under conversations with uh, FPK, with RTD, all the operators, because maybe in a near future for commuter trains also, because you know that high-speed trains, you need high-speed trains in a limited way, but commuter trains, for example, are very used in all the countries, and we are now under conversations for future commuter trains to Russia. Okay, so the second question is, the track gauge system developed by Talgo can be applied to freight wagons? Okay, that's a very good question also. Thank you very much. Um, yes, the answer is that this technology is, uh, could be considered not only for passengers, but also for freight wagons. Um, in the present, we have not worked with uh, freight wagons. In Talgo, we have always worked with uh, passengers but we not discard for the future to consider the development on a freight wagon changing gauge system, because it's possible, of course. Uh, does Talco has a kind of special program for young engineers, uh, kind of training program uh, for the developing of new technologies in the future? Um, in Talgo, we have a specific program. This is the second year that we have implemented. It's called Young Talent in Talgo. Um, it's a program opened, uh, these first years, it's open only for Spanish people, but we consider to extend this model to all the countries where we have trains. And this program considers students, uh, good students, young talent students that are interested in the railway sector. And after several interviews, our human resources department, they select the best ones. And they are one complete year being trained in Talgo in different um, manufacturers, uh, factories, sorry, and installations or facilities of Talgo. They are trained during one complete year. And after this training are automatically in Talgo in one of the departments of one of our engineers. And we repeat, we repeat this model every year, and we are considering the future to extend it to all the countries that we have Talgo facilities or Talgo trains running. Okay, thank you very much. I think that uh, that uh, were all the questions for you. Thank you once again for your presentation, and I would like to add that um, since the last year, uh, our university is uh, having uh, kind of uh, um, meetings uh, in order to start cooperation with Talgo company. So um, uh, we think that in the nearest future, we can also invite um, uh, engineers and uh, researchers from Talgo company to participate in our students project marathon that we are implementing also joint with the uh, UPM and that in the nearest future will also um, can discuss uh, joint educational or research program with Talgo company. So thank you very much and now we are thank you very uh, much. I would like Thank you. I would like to give a floor to our uh, next speaker, Professor Luis Conde. 
Uh, professor Louis Conder is a professor of the Department of Applied Physics in Aerospace Technologies uh, of the UPM Aerospace School. So, please. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everybody. I will now share my cover, my screen. So. So now. Can you see it? Can you see my screen? Yeah, yes, yes, we can see it. So, thank you very much. So, uh, my uh, presentation uh, will introduce to you to one ongoing collaboration between our universities, by the Polytechnic University of Madrid and Polytech in the St. Petersburg. And also we have uh, involved one uh, an, uh, industrial partner which uh, is Aeronova, which is an aerospace, uh, multinational aerospace uh, company based in Spain, the Basque uh, country, that is uh, specialized in the working in, the, in building big, uh, big uh, aerospace tractors. So uh, this uh, title of my presentation is uh, Pragma Tractor for in space Propulsion Satellite. So this means, um, Many of you uh, are not familiar with the subject, which is uh, that will take place in our lives. Professor Konda, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm yes? sorry. Uh, uh, I've seen that we can't see your shared screen on YouTube translation. You yes. can see the screen. Yeah. Now, now we can. Okay. Yeah. So, now you can. Okay. okay. Thank you. I'm Thank sorry. You. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So. Uh, the discussion of uh, plasma thrusters uh, for in space propulsion may be not familiar to many of you, so I will briefly understand, uh, introduce. So, uh, I'm sure uh, that most of you know, uh, uh, we're all familiar with uh, science, that's read about 40 years with uh, long telecommunication, big telecommunication satellites. Uh, the big telecommunication satellites operate in a quasi circular orbit about 36,000 kilometers away from the Earth's surface uh, to be uh, in the equatorial uh, plane of the Earth. There is uh, only 400 slot or quantum positions are available. And this uh, communication typically uh, system typically operates over 10 or 50 years and are essentially passive. This means we all know that all the information uh, that provided by this uh, big geostationary satellite is, uh, is, is special. You cannot interact uh, with this satellite except you have a very complex and expensive equipment. But today the, the market is changes. The satellite market is now facing a very major change and uh, because uh, basically because uh, the actual internet and today we need uh, planetary access for internet. Why? This is because uh, the new application of internet, such as, for example, automatic vehicle driving. You know, Tesla company and many other economic uh, actors are uh, claiming the idea that the, not to have a driver in, the, in a bus or not to have a driver in a train or, for example, uh, the communication or the television in coverage of super houses in the middle of the ocean, we don't have internet. And most importantly, obviously, the global communication. The basic idea is to have a global communication network. If you see the internet, you will find the internet is not accessible in many places on the earth. Uh, there is large areas or uh, America or Asia where uh, Internet uh, contact is difficult to find. Basically, because the government, the local government, cannot uh, usually afford the cost of cabling or the, the country and uh, private uh, private investors have very low revenue. So, in the small countries in uh, South America or Asia, it's very difficult to find a reliable network internet table. Another important uh, application is interactive television. You know, uh, you see the television today, the uh, uh, customers 
who like to interact with the television program. So internet is not accessible and we need this global communication. So uh, this is not possible with, all, with the classical geostationary big telecommunication satellites. So at 36,000 kilometers to communicate with the satellite to make an interaction, you will need of a very, very expensive equipment, large antenna that we need to be very carefully positioned. So it's not possible that uh, the general public to access to this kind of communication. Today we have an alternative. The alternative is very more complex. This is the basic idea is depicted in the figure, in the side figure. So we can use instead of very high and expensive telecommunication satellite, a lot of small satellite orbiting in or low Earth orbit. Uh, this is called usually LEO. So low Earth orbit means about uh, 400 kilometers. So each satellite will cover a small portion of their surface, but they, the network of satellite will communicate between themselves. So interacting between satellites, we, we need about three satellites simultaneously in a, in a, in a, to cover an area of the Earth. So they can provide interaction to on-ground users with the satellite, and the satellite with other satellites. So information could, could be exchanged as a, as a network. This is much more difficult from the point of view of space uh, industry than, uh, than uh, just at another satellite. Because this satellite will not lie in, in orbit uh, for long. In this uh, uh, 400 kilometers, it still remain as a very, very little, but existed, uh, interacting with the air, uh, with the air atmosphere and so So, but this is not a static fiction. Here in this slide, I depicted, I show you one model of the one of the economic uh, or one of the network which is deployed right now, which is called OneWeb. This satellite model uh, needs to be a cut to below typically 1,000. Uh, I said it's not right. 1,000, uh, 1 million dollars. Sorry. Or the terminal that you will be, you will have soon in your living room need to have a price of below $2,000. Uh, so this is a major change in the aerospace industry because satellites is not one satellite and high cost, uh, one high cost communication satellite. We need to produce satellites that need to be exchanged like more uh, like, with shorter times. This means the satellite will not survive in orbit the 15 years that the uh, telecommunication telecommunication satellites of today operate. So we need to replace the uh, satellite, let's say, in one or two years. So we need to receive the system and the light and design and production of satellites because the production of the satellite will be much more similar to the automobile industry. So to make uh, this Cost, uh, this constellation of satellites to be to have economic uh, economic sense, we need to think completely the idea how a satellite is built. So, like in the automobile industry, we will need to component material producer, large scale production, standardization, and so on. Maybe you think that this is something for the future, but no, we you are we are now living with this. In this slide, in this table, I show you some of the uh, initiatives that are uh, today. On, today, for example, you have maybe heard about the Starlink SpaceX, uh, Starlink uh, satellite launched by the SpaceX company. They will operate in Leo, in lower orbit, and the number of satellites to be deployed is about 1,200. This satellite is now uh, under deployment and will operate in the Kiev band. Or, for example, one, satellite, one web satellite I saw it in the previous slide also operates in, in lower orbit. And uh, the number of the satellites to be deployed is about 600. And some of them are in operation now. And the main contractor for the satellite production in Airbus. Or, for example, um, Iridium Next is also in operation, or laser like with this use a very different optical communication system, this is in operation too. So this information in the stables is not exhausted, and it's continuously involving in time. For example, this is a risky business. One web satellite has a financial problem, 
and uh, I say that nothing for the uh, now. So if this is an example of how life takes place today, sorry, how the life is today. So uh, in the photograph top left here, this is a photograph. It's not in any case a kind of simulation. This is the cargo bay of a Falcon 9 a rocket man manufactured by the SpaceX. And here you can see the role of six to sat Starlink satellite that are launched before uh, being released in space. So uh, that means that the number of satellites we have around the Earth in lower orbit is in continued increasing. So to see this has some, some wanted effect, for example, this photograph here on the bottom left, uh, we are very fortunate in Spain uh, because the uh, Canary Island has one of the best sky, or the most clean sky on Earth to make um, for um, astronomical observation. So uh, when, if you want to make a photograph of this, uh, of, a, of a comet, as this is the plate, and this is the case in this photograph, here is the comet, so you will see, you will need to make the uh, exposition, the time in which you expose the, the film of the camera, uh, a little bit long. So in this case, this photograph was written, the photograph the, of the comet was written, because as you can see, this line is the part of the satellite, Starlink satellite, as they overfly the Canary Island. Those satellites can be also seen in this, uh, in this uh, small video. These bright dots are starling satellites flying over Leiden in Holland. Because the starling satellite, uh, the satellites are high, these uh, bright dots are the satellite illuminated by the sunlight. We are at night, in the, the observer is at night, but because of the height of the satellite, it is still is illuminated by the sun. So this is why you see the right dot of the satellite uh, uh, moving into the solar after the launcher. The results, unfortunately, the result is the, the, the photographs on the side. In which if you expose the camera for long, you will see the traces of the satellite, uh, the traces of the satellite recorded in the film. Constellation introduced a very a lot of problem, a lot of new uh, problems in the aerospace industry. So the first thing is the space proportion. You are very familiar with the uh, with the chemical rocket that you see in the all the, in the news reels or in the in the film, in which a very uh, a very extra energetic chemical reaction produces a lot of gas that thrusts or power the, the rocket. So you may understand, you can understand that the first thing, the first problem of this uh, constellation is propulsion. Why? The first thing we need to make this, uh, the system is uh, to exchange, uh, to make the constellation to operate, to have economic sense, and they exchange information. So satellites need to live in very precise orbit at the same time. Unfortunately, we have orbital drag at low altitude. So we need a small force to compensate the deviation of the orbit of the satellite. And the satellite needs also to have flight formation. This means all the satellites must see the others. And this is a very difficult problem because it's not a, control, a clear control path how to control the situation of free satellites that exchange information between them. And finally, we don't want this a uh, satellite will last, don't last for long, so they need to be a uh, returner or destroyer. They send uh, big telecommunication satellites that are, are so high as the uh, geostationary orbit, uh, I remember you, about 36,000 kilometers. These satellites are usually raised to a much higher orbit where uh, they remain as a graveyard as a orbit. Uh, they leave the slot for communication, remember there is only 400 uh, slots available to other communication satellites. But what happened in lower uh, orbit? Lower orbit is 400 kilometers high. So we need at the end to make a strategy to uh, eliminate the satellite 
from the uh, orbital uh, low orbit in order to avoid the propagation of the orbital or the um, junk in orbit. Otherwise, we can interfere with our system or to make a catastrophic uh, collision with other orbit. Uh, so, um, chemical propulsion is not a solution for this constellation of satellite. All the satellites you see in this in this uh, in this uh, in this, in, this, in this picture, don't use chemical uh, thruster. They are using plasma thruster. And why plasma thruster? This is the next question. So, uh, I will not into the mathematical details, but here in this, uh, in this uh, figure, it represented the mass of the propeller over the final mass. So, when you need to want to make a maneuver in orbit, you need to use some kind of propeller. And here it represents the is the actual speed. So you have a rocket, you expel uh, gases, expel whatever, and this produces a thrust according to the very basic law of acting and reacting. So a simple calculation used in the the Sion cost equation show you that this is an exponential decrease of the actual speed. So the less the higher it is the actual speed. The less fraction of propellant you need. So, for example, this dotted line corresponds to the, the vertical water line corresponds to the maximum attainable uh, the speed that can be obtained with a chemical rocket. Why? Because we have to limit to the, uh, to the uh, maximum exothermal reaction we have, we, already, we know by now. So the maximum velocity is 5.5 kilometers per second. This is a, a maximum. This is the maximum velocity we can reach, and this affects the thrust. And but more important, it affects the amount of propellant, the amount of propellant needed. So uh, the electric propulsion is a very attractive idea. Why? Because uh, uh, the acceleration of electric charge is independent of the chemical nature of the propellant. So uh, we can, in principle, using an, uh, an electric fuel to accelerate these uh, ions or this uh, propellant to any velocity. So electric propulsion is, uh, in this uh, correspond today to the commercial uh, electric propulsion system to exit speed between 20 and 60 kilometers per second. So, uh, but uh, the problem with this is we have is this use of electric propulsion requires a new technology. We need to change or introduce new technology to meet this demand requisite for this small satellite this uh, satellite of a constellation of a small satellite, because the satellite is very small, and electric power inside this thing can be made available is very low because the panel, solar panels are also small. So today, plasma tractor is the only to the, uh, response for the propulsion needs. A plasma is a, a medium which is made with ion and electrons in which uh, basically a partially unit of neutral gas. So the highest energy speed is obtained by acceleration of the plasma, that is basically acceleration the ion, to high, very high exit speed that cannot be obtained with the classical chemical propulsion. As you can understand, just, just to make you an idea of how important is this, uh, this issue, let's make a, a small calculation. If you have the chemical engine, and for example, I, this is the maximum velocity is 4.4 4, 4 km per second, and this is the velocity of the speed shuttle main engine. So to make a, a maneuver, for example, for a satellite of one ton, you will need 400, about 400 kilograms of propellant. But what happens if we increase to the velocity of the propellant to this region where the electric propulsion, so, uh, uh, to the high velo higher velocity to the electric propulsion, to the velocity characteristic of the electric propulsion. 
So we get about 20,000 kilometers per second. This is not a strain. Today, it is obtained at this velocity with, uh, with the ion security of ion engine. So if we make the same calculation, we see the reduction in the weight of propellant required is only of, uh, we, we will need only of 78 kilograms. So the difference is 400 minus so about 800, uh, 880 uh, kilograms. This means that more about 3,000 kilograms are of weight of uh, propellant that is useless are as part using electric propulsion. That means in this case about one third of the initial satellite money. So you can see that this problem is crucial for the economic competitiveness of satellite systems. Signed, the propellant saving permit to increase the weight of system that can be used for other activity. For example, more channels, uh, more radio channels, more transponders, more uh, equipment to communicate with the clients that are on ground. So uh, this means that the electric, the competitiveness of the system is very important. So uh, this is why today there is a a, 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 a very uh, a very active race to uh, develop system, efficient system for electric propulsion. So in this case uh, we. Uh, we made a very small uh, consortium between the Polytechnic University of, uh, of St. Petersburg and the Polytechnic University of Madrid to uh, work in this specific area in which we are free group involved, I mentioned before, the group leaders by Professor Steven in, the, in St. Petersburg, our group, and our commercial partner, which is the, uh, the aerospace uh, company, uh, Arnold. So our current activities today is the low power plasma cluster for small satellites. At those of these constellations I already mentioned, you may understand now that the problem with the low power is because the electric power available in the satellite is very limited. This needs to cover not only the thrust, the motion of the satellite to help to move to move the satellite, but also all the other component radio. Um, radio transmission and so on. So, uh, in this case, uh, the group of Polytech is working in very narrative multi detail configuration for ion matter applications. And uh, we are also very interested in electron sources for space application. Why? Because electron sources, we need electrons in space for many, uh, for many different, uh, active, uh, very different uh, technologies. And finally, and also, we have academic activities in, uh, in, in collaboration with the, between the Polytechs and the Polytechnica. We have the idea to have a joint doctor, and also we have lecture courses between both uh, universities. So, uh, the, this is an example of the new uh, concept that the St. Petersburg group has in low power plasma transfer. I will not think into the details. But let's say that this is a, uh, in this slide, in this slide you see two different configurations of electrodes. That has electrodes uh, that are simulated with using computers. The trajectories of the ions can be seen here in blue and, and red. In, in this case, on the left is purely the static acceleration, and on the right is the same, but to improve the collimation of the trajectory of the uh, ions, we use an additional magnet. This magnet is a uh, cylindrical magnet. So this is very important because the uh, efficiency of the system improves. So far, we uh, avoid the system has a radial component of the velocity. So simulation is extremely interesting, the simulation, because as you can see in the, in the, in the figure, this is the velocity of the ions represented again is the uh, the axial coordinate along one of this structure you see in the uh, in the figure. So the most important point it is the is the velocity the ion rate. Remember this figure with the velocity. Uh, when I explained the uh, how critical is the velocity, we saw we saw about twenty to sixty kilometers per second for usual or conventional electric propulsion. So this configuration 
developed by Professor Zimmer and his group, is able to accelerate the system at a active velocity of 140 km per second. So, this lavish cell velocity is well known over the state of the art of the electric propulsion today. So, remember how the longer we accelerate the uh, ions or the propellant, the lower is the mass or the propellant we need. So, we have seen joint publication. And the other side, this is a, a core plasma laboratory in, uh, in the UPM, in which we all, uh, have period in uh, low power plasma thruster. On the right, you can see a, video, a picture of our laboratory where we have now about, uh, we have now three different vacuum tanks in which we can test all the, uh, all, we can test the, uh, pro the prototype of our plasma thruster. And we hope that also to collaborate in the testing of the plasma thruster from St. Petersburg University. We already have some here on, uh, on our, uh, we, we call our uh, plasma thruster the ALFI. The ALFI is the acronym for the Alternative Low Power Hybrid Ion Engine. It's very small and you can see the ALFI uh, thruster in this photograph. The ALFI is only in the, uh, it's at the extreme, it's the cylinder at the extreme at the end of this structure. That is ready for testing in the vacuum tank. And in the right photograph, you can see the alpha working in one of our vacuum tanks, where you see this blue mist that is produced by the argon uh, plasma. So here you can see this blue mist is, uh, is, is uh, correspond to an uh, argon plasma fire and electron that is ejected by this alpha at super uh, uh, supersonic velocities. Supersonic for a plasma being about uh, 20 to 60 kilometers per second. So this technology, this is a proprietary technology. We already patented this. Is, the the, the Alfi is an innovative design, and we have already patented in the European patent and the use patent for this uh, for this uh, technology that uh, we, that was made with the help of our uh, commercial partner. So the application of the alpha will be station keeping, for example, or station keeping means the uh, the ability of the of the of the truck to keep the orbit, it means no, no, no to avoid the deviation of the orbit, or with that compensation, all this application of end of flight is possible of satellite because when the satellite has end this mission, we can also turn it on and drop the satellite again with, uh, again in the atmosphere in a controlled way. And most important again, flight formation. This small thrust produced by the electric uh, thruster can make the can help turn the satellites in the constellation to keep the relative position to exchange the to exchange or exchange information. So if you want more information or contact us. This is uh, here in this slide you have the the, the detail. So all these activities are currently funded in part by research program, uh, project that we uh, won in competitive calls. For example, we are now currently working in black magnetic diagnostic for uh, we have our uh, from the office funded by the Spanish Ministry of the uh, Science and Innovation. And this activity on electron sources is very important because we need the electron for primary plasma propulsion to produce the plasma. I mean, we need to produce the uh, ionization event of a neutral gas atom. So to ionize, to ionize the gas, we need to impact the uh, atom with an electron, so electron sources are needed. But also very important is to, uh, is to neutralize the ion flow. That means we do produce a lot of ions. The electric field, uh, the electric field cannot uh, has a limit. So to overcome this limit, you need to provide the electron to make the average electric field uh, field. Uh, no. So today, uh, European Community in his Horizon 2020 program to share, we have a, there is a special uh, a special uh, initiative to uh, for the uh, uh, innovation of electric propulsion. So 
we collaborate in an, in, in this electron product, specifically this electron product, uh, production system. We, product, we work with a set of uh, universities with the novel electron material for enhanced electrical propulsion solution, the acronym of this uh, project is Nemesis. And the consulting is made, is composed by an, an independent company, which is the advanced term of the bias, which is the coordination. Our university, our group, is in this consulting too. Two universities, uh, two a university in Germany, the Justo Vierge Universität, and a French and a space aerospace uh, company in France, which is called Exotrial, and an organization for uh, technology transfer in Austria. So if you need more information about this project, there is the uh, website, the, 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 our website. So I think that uh, you have, I show you what is the, the basic uh, scenario of our uh, research activities, the joint activities between the uh, Polytechnic University in St. Petersburg and us. And uh, also a new field, this is a new field, and uh, I am ready for your question. So thank you for your time and interest. Thank you very much, Professor Kunde, for uh, such uh, detailed information about your research projects and especially about uh, our joint project uh, between uh, Politecnica de Madrid and Peter the Great St. Petersburg Polytechnic University. I would also like to add that um, uh, during the last months, we are uh, in a process of agreeing of uh, um, joint uh, or course supervising of PhD student. Um, it's like joint PhD between Politecnica de Madrid and uh, Peter the Great Polytechnic University. And I hope that uh, in the nearest future we'll end up with all the um, documents and with the agreement and uh, that will start also this joint project. So, um, as I can see, there are no questions actually from our listeners, but I can see that our listeners are really impressed uh, by your presentation. So, um, thank you very much. Thank you. So, I think that now um, we are going to our next speaker, uh, Professor William Mingus. Professor Emilia Minges is um, working uh, at the Department of Nuclear Engineering at the School of Industrial Engineers at UPM. And currently, <coughs> he is the president of European Nuclear Society. So, please. Okay, thank you, Elena. I don't know how to share the, uh, my, my, my short presentation. Uh, I don't know so, how to do there is a um, kind of button Be also. This is, uh, I cannot show the button because it's the first time I use this uh, Google system to the uh, connection. But uh, anyway, it's different. So uh, anyway, I try to... So kind of uh, three dots um, in the bottom of your screen. It is internal caption. I don't know. Yeah, and uh, there to the left, to the left of these dots, you will see the button for share your screen. No, I cannot say that's in my my one. So anyway, I I can uh, say uh, only a short presentation because I am not going so in so detail that my uh, previous colleagues. Uh, first of all, I I would like to thank uh, this uh, uh, this workshop between the two universities, Polytechnical from St. Petersburg and Polytechnical University of Madrid. So I, when I was invited to, to enter in this workshop, I was uh, received information just to express my experience and relationship with the Polytechnical from St. Petersburg. So that is what I'm going to say in my, in my uh, view. So, my first relationship uh, with the St. Petersburg started uh, about four years ago when I was uh, the dean of the School of Industrial Engineering at the Polytechnic University of Madrid. And uh, Sergei uh, Guskov 
uh, organized uh, a visit to to visit several uni several universities in St. Petersburg, especially the Polytechnical, and be, with the interest to initiate relationship to exchange professors and students for that school of the UBM. So I visited the first time in July uh, 2017, and it was uh, visiting several laboratories at uh, St. Petersburg, and uh, also uh, I have a meeting, a meeting about one hour or two hours, I don't remember how, uh, with the uh, international uh, relationship department. And also to introduce the School of Industrial Engineering about the different activities at the different departments, not only in the nuclear, but also in, uh, in the other ones, because at that time I was the dean of that school. So it was very interesting for me just to, to know the big activities and many, uh, uh, we can share many kind of different uh, research or activities and also organize these several events and also to exchange not only students, but it was more important at that time, but also a professor to uh, have the possibility to continue all the relationship between both institutions. So the second time I was in official delegation of the UBM with our rector for the anniversary of Agustin de Betancourt in 2018. So the more important activities that I share with that university is because I was invited uh, as a professor in the summer energy school in the nuclear energy area, teaching one week from July 30 to August 3, this one week, 16 hours in 2018, to students uh, attending that summer course from several countries. I remember some of the big students from China, a very good student from Iran, some student from India, Italy, Spain, and also Russia. So the second time I was invited the next year in, 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 19, uh, in 2019, uh, teaching uh, almost the same time of hours, one week. Uh, and there were uh, other different students small from China, but from Czechia, Italy, Spain, Russia, Portugal, USA. At this time, it was the first time they uh, uh, attract three students from the uh, School of Industrial Engineering from UPM to attend this, uh, this summer course. And also at the same year, at the beginning of that year, I was in an official delegation for the uh, centenary of the Polytech. So, and I have, in all my visits, several, uh, several meetings, small meetings, with some professors for the nuclear engineering department, organized by Ms. Katerina Sokolova and Professor Federovich. So my comments to this, uh, my experience, especially in the summer course, I have to translate to possible students that has been uh, uh, following this, uh, this seminar is a very, very positive, I can say. Uh, students can show experience with all their students from not only from Russia, but from other countries, and also with foreign students, uh, foreign professors, sorry, and also to know the nice city of St. Petersburg that I, I can say that I love a lot. It is a very nice uh, city, even in, in winter, okay. So the first years, I couldn't attract a student from UPM to attend the summer course, but in the second one, as I say before, I catch a three year student that they spent three weeks and their experience was very successful. And they was very evaluated, interested, and translated to other students. So I was also uh, 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 preliminary invited to the 20, 20 but uh, of course I, 
I, I was not able because the last uh, academic uh, year or this academic year, I uh, not the last academic year, sorry, I was in uh, my sabbatical year and I was visiting several other countries and I was not able to attend even the uh, winter's course, uh, but uh, not all, and, and of course not in summer course because of the pandemic. I think it's a very good way to initiate a change between the students for a long period of time, uh, especially one semester, one year, or just collaboration with other uh, professors there, not only for the nuclear, but also for other departments. It is also a good opportunity for predoctoral students for being involved in one mutual research project, uh, spending one month, two months uh, there, just uh, working in the same uh, in, in the same field of the of the very interesting project in collaboration. So, in one of the the, the visit, uh, several of the two or three visits uh, we have, as I say before, uh, meetings with the, the, the professor. Of the, of the department of the nuclear department. And we uh, identify several points of mutual collaboration. One is about uh, working on the thermodynamics for nuclear power plants. Most of these, uh, most of these uh, uh, points are uh, in the area of the nuclear especially in the thermodynamics of nuclear power plants, because it's very important for the new cycles, especially a supercritical CO2 uh, cycle. Um, just for the computational analysis of heat and mass transfer, and also hydrodynamic processes in accident situation nuclear reactor, especially in active zones. The other point in this, uh, in this uh, paragraph is thermal design of steam generators and heat exchanges at nuclear power plants. This is a very important thing because this is extended for the small modular reactor. A small modular reactor have some of the components integrate in the vessel and they use some kind of the steam generation very quite different for the big nuclear power plant. So, and this is the, trans, the energy transmission in this steam generation is very specific and there is a very, uh, have to uh, be considering in different other places around the world. I, 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 I could understand during my uh, sabbatical year in Argentina, in Korea, uh, that they have been involved also in this kind of work. So the second point is the, this, the analysis of the system for emergency and also the preparedness and response. So especially develop passive system for accident coolant of water pools for the storage of the spent nuclear fuel. This is one of the important areas that uh, the, the, the utilities are very concerned about this kind of things. So also the storage of the fuel elements in dry cask for long-term storage and what is the uh, simulation using uh, CFD uh, computer calls. And also is about the topics about uh, the sodium fast reactor safety. They are very area of the generation for reactors using uh, sodium uh, technology, sodium fast technology and there is uh, important about considering the nuclear safety of this kind of devices. So we identify also simulation of the same basis accidents, especially for a small and large uh, break uh, loss of coolant accident, and also the severe accidents uh, for the, not only for the for the present uh, nuclear power plant, but also for the for the new uh, reactors, generation four, 
and also for the uh, small modular reactor or micro reactors. So the methodology for long-term fuel, cladding temperature, evaluation, is also very important under development in several other laboratories. Vibration monitoring using model analysis techniques, it was a very interest for a professor at the Polytechnic University of St. Petersburg. And in all these points was with the main idea, especially for the exchange professors for working together and also for the exchange students at the level of the master of the uh, PhD thesis. So, and um, uh, also for the preparation of mutual publication in very high uh, journals uh, considered. Also, the, the probabilistic safety analysis was identified as a very key point. So, let me say a few words about the energy engineering department in which the nuclear group uh, is now integrated in this engineering department. Because years ago, we was in the uh, nuclear engineering department, but due to the reduction of number of the department at the UPM, we was uh, considered it most interesting to be integrated in the energy engineering department. So in this engineering department, they have many uh, research uh, topics in, in, in general, I have to say, especially in the nuclear field, is in the nuclear advanced reactors. Especially, we have a lot of interest in generation four and also in a small modular reactor or in micro reactor that can be used as a batteries for several applications. Also, area is a nuclear fusion. This means, uh, especially in the relation interaction with the matter, and the generation of energy, uh, material use in this uh, different uh, installation, and also about the final technology for the one uh, nuclear power plant using nuclear fusion energy. They have also interesting in hydrogen generation, not only by nuclear, but other sources, but in, in, it is very interesting also the analysis of safety or safety of the installation using or a storage uh, amount of hydrogen. Uh, electric, electrical mobility with uh, batteries or with, uh, with uh, motorbikes and so on. It is also an area of research in this department. Renewable energies, of course, it is in the area of wind and solar thermal. This is very uh, activities in this. So nuclear in non electrical application, for instance, for instance, for the desalination water, for the generation of hydrogen, for uh, uh, other kind of application for uh, heavy industry especially for the, uh, the, the heat uh, uh, used to, uh, for, the for the industry. And also they have uh, several professors involved in uh, uh, assessment about the uh, mixing of the uh, uh, electricity in a decarbonized system using different energy clean, different using, use, uses of clean energies. And also, as I say before, the thermodynamics, thermodynamical, the thermodynamic cycles, especially the supercritical CO2. So, uh, it is uh, important, uh, there is, uh, because of the identification of that point, not only for the energy engineering department, but also for the nuclear, we initiate uh, in 2019, in the second part of the 2019, just to identify, to organize uh, a workshop uh, sharing uh, both uh, professors and advanced students. Uh, 
in Madrid or in, in St. Petersburg to identify a very deep uh, uh, analysis the um, ways to uh, attack the different points that we identified that was very interesting in both parts to share and to collaborate. Due to the uh, several situation, we had not uh, followed uh, that uh, contact to uh, uh, organize this workshop. But uh, maybe after this workshop and the interest of both sides, both universities, we will run again to follow the topics and keep the collaboration. So in other areas, especially in the nuclear, let me say that we have in collaboration with other uh, uh, Russian institution. Uh, very recently, I have been in uh, contacted by the Central University of Moscow by video conference because this conference, this uh, university is in one uh, platform in which I was the vice president in Europe. It is the European Nuclear Engineering Network. It's in an association. It's one association that I was a co-founder in 2002. Uh, and there is very interesting to uh, the, 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 the goal of that video conference was to initiate a collaboration on a master that they are uh, initiate on the dismantling of nuclear installation. You have to know that in the world they have 450 nuclear power plants in operation and about in from, from now to uh, maybe 10 or 20 years about half of them will be dismantling and we need uh, specialists for the preparation of the very high quali qualified for these uh, these areas. So the we need to 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 uh, to contact again to have uh, to uh, initiate or to advance in this in this way. Just to say is we collaborate as a university because this is a very multidisciplinary. Uh, a project in which in the dismantling of the nuclear installation, nuclear power plant, or other facility of the nuclear uh, fuel cycle uh, can collaborate not only the nuclear uh, engineering expert, but also mechanical, uh, civil engineers, electrical engineers, chemical engineers, and maybe others, just to uh, participate in the master or just in the participation at the beginning for professors from UPN. And we have also some important relationship with Rosaton. Rosaton is the, is the nuclear uh, 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 center in which are uh, co concentrated most of the activities of the nuclear, of the nuclear field, the nuclear sector in Russia. And they used to organize several specialist courses in, uh, in several subjects of nuclear power plants, and uh, some of the, our students from UPM had been attending to that. So with this, I finish my short presentation, but I have to say that our students, that when uh, in principle, without uh, knowing the, the language, the Russian language, they are very interested in just collaboration and to attend it, maybe several uh, uh, courses, uh, official courses or summer courses. And uh, this is a very good initiative to initiate or to enhance the participation of our uh, students in this uh, uh, field of uh, research as it was presented by my two colleagues before in, uh, in the, in the, in the in the Targo and also about the uh, aerospace, but also in the industrial uh, school that they have many activities to share. So thank you very much. And Alana, it's a pleasure to, to, to meet you again uh, now by video conference.
Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Mingis. Uh, it, uh, it's a pleasure for me also to see all of you um, online. Yes, now uh, online, but I hope that in the nearest future we'll have an opportunity to uh, meet personally and uh, to develop cooperation between our universities. And I'm personally uh, very proud that we have such a strong cooperation between our universities. At the moment, we have several joint projects uh, in progress, such as student project marathon uh, in the field of uh, material science. Also, course supervising of PhD students uh, in the field of aerospace technologies. Joint research, uh, joint researches and projects uh, in energetics, and there are also several modules of SPBPU summer school that are coordinated both by professors from SPBPU and by professors from UPM. Uh, for example, Professor Mingis and Professor Ponder uh, are um, uh, teachers. Uh, uh, on two of our modules of uh, summer school. So, and also since 2019, uh, Information Center of SPBPU in Madrid is based, um, is operating on the basis of uh, Politecnica de Madrid. And uh, we are really proud. And uh, I hope that in the nearest future, we'll manage to do even more together and we'll uh, develop our cooperation. So uh, I would like to uh, say thanks to all the participants of our seminar today. It was really a pleasure to see you today here online. And I hope that uh, uh, our listeners uh, today uh, found some new and interesting information for them. And uh, we'll get uh, maybe uh, some kind of feedback from them after, after our seminar. So maybe uh, some of you have also something to say at the end of the seminar. Oh, only thank you to you, uh, Spasiva. <laughs> um, thank you. Muchas <laughs> gracias <laughs> from our side. <laughs> okay. Thank you very thank you. much from my side. Yeah. Thank you very much from my side. Thank you for your attention and we hope to collaborate in the future. Okay. From my side, so, thank you very much as well. It has been a pleasure and we hope we can continue cooperating with uh, both universities with Salvo because we really think that this approach between universities and companies are really needed for the near future. Thank you very much. Okay. Oh, thank you. thank you. Okay. See you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.